is Dr. Henning Schultzrinne, who is a professor at Columbia University, the former CTO of the FCC, and who is the author of the SIP and many other important RFCs that uh, support real-time media and real-time communications. So, Thank Henning. You. Always nice. Thank you. Uh, always nice to be uh, back here, and I'm going to be talking about a topic uh, 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 probably uh, it's certainly one of those topics which has attracted far more headlines uh, and speeches and everything else than maybe actual say, technical detail work. So I'm going to be presenting today some thoughts on 5G. Not that I can promise that afterwards you'll precisely know what it is any more than you did walking in, but maybe it gets you to think about all differently about some of the challenges uh, that we do face as we transition from a 4G type of environment uh, to a 5G, whatever precisely that may be. And one of the problems that I think the whole discussion of when we started the notion of G's in uh, the wireless world is that this is seen as essentially a transition where there is a clear demarcation as in mine, you stop 4G and then you go into 5G or 2G into 3G or whatever. But that's not really how things ended up working. And namely, generally speaking, we have systems that survive quite a few years in each of their incarnations. So, for example, the purple one on, on the last bar is an estimate by a consulting company that does this type of stuff, where they estimated the total lifetime from presumably initial deployment to large-scale disappearance in the sense where it's no longer a mainstream technology. And generally speaking, the claim is that each of these generations lasts about 20 years, which means that by definition, if you do a new generation, let's say every 10-ish years, you'll always have two generations that largely overlap. So this is very different than what we think of, and I used the UK version uh, for that, and we think of human generations where you can argue as exactly which birth year uh, puts you in what generation, if you're a millennial or uh, generation X or generation Z or whatever the new ones are, uh, where there's generally one year so that the marketers can figure that one out. With cellular generations, really not so much. Uh, it is really more of a continual evolution in that, except maybe when we went from 1G, the analog, to 2G, digital, that was just completely disjoint. Air, air interface different, just about everything is different. Which means we're seeing essentially a increasing generational overlap. And indeed, it could happen that 2G lasts longer than 3G simply because in some rural areas you may only have 2G coverage for quite a long time because they may be provided by small rural carriers that never upgrade and all they do is provide voice and SMS coverage in that relatively remote area uh, in that. Or you may do it for interoperability reasons or whatever else. The other point that I wanted to make is that we usually, so when we talk about generations, there are two things happening. Namely, one is kind of the input side. What do we anticipate? What's kind of a marketing promise that is made by vendors, by pundits, all of that, that defines what the generation is? What is it, I mean, what's the new thing? It's after all, it's a cell phone or some whatever, you smartphone or whatever, a mobile device, whatever terminology you want to use. So you have to promise something fundamentally new. Right? A salvation is just around one more G type of thing. And so in order to do that, people usually have some notion, and I'll talk about those in a little bit, I, that defines what that new thing is, and then that's used to drive the technical requirements. Bandwidth, system architecture, handsets, all the other things are supposedly 
driven by that. It used to be fairly simple. It was bandwidth, essentially. You had voice only to my increasing zeros on the bandwidth uh, on that. I mean, the basic rule is that whatever bandwidth is promised for generation N, you kind of get, if you're lucky, for generation N plus one, but we'll leave that aside. So, for example, the promises that were made for 4G, that you get 100 megabits, I think, was roughly uh, the promise, at least. Well, obviously, I don't know how many people see 100 megabits on, on their 4G connection. Uh, if you do, you probably sit on the cell tower uh, in a lab somewhere, but not in real world. So what are some of the generational surprises? So one of the things that you had was 2G, and I wasn't quite around, at least not actively involved in that particular development, but there was a notion that you're a digital voice. No longer analog FM type voice, but your digital voice. But the surprise was really the major innovation that was as, man, this is a well-known kind of story that, man, there was nobody thought of text messaging except as a means for carriers to provide uh, information about roaming and things like that and bills being due to their customers as opposed to a mass communication media that would slowly uh, at least for the teenage crowd, overtake voice as a communication means. So again, the architecture was SMS as a low bandwidth, low frequency, message frequency uh, type of service, and it turned out to be probably the single most important driver that got people to move to 2G in that case. And for 3G, the notion was we would create a specialized web application. Who still remembers WAP? Oh, okay. Good. Uh, anybody have used WAP ever? I mean, maybe so a few people. Uh, and maybe for a brief time until you get frustrated with it. And then the real notion was that people really wanted the same services that they had on their web browser at the time, uh, namely basic web pages at least uh, in that model. So again, the notion what the carrier thought would drive it, namely specialized information retrieval mediated and possibly monetized by carriers, what people wanted was, I just want the same web pages that I get on, on, on my home browser, on my PC browser. 4G again, the notion, one of the major promises besides more bandwidth was uh, IMS, uh, multimedia subsystem would, internet multimedia subsystem would provide uh, internet video, it would provide text and high quality voice and all these other fancy call features. Well, IMS kind of got deployed, but we still, even for carriers that have OLT, it's largely voice. I mean, you don't, as far as I know, I mean, there might be some RCS implementations out there, but uh, I haven't really seen much usage of carrier provided a uh, multimedia calling uh, in that. I mean, it's really just been a replacement, slightly better voice quality, uh, and you have on 2G voice. The surprise on the other side was what people really wanted was watching YouTube cat videos, uh, was WhatsApp over the top texting, and interestingly enough, that would, what happened is that a lot of notifications uh, type of things, namely calendar notification, SMS notifications, uh, other event-based systems that sprung up that leveraged the notion that, that your smartphone was something that was always with you, so it made sense to use that Waze would send you an alert when there was a traffic jam, all of these type of things. I don't think that's really been anticipated when that was designed. It was, the focus was very much on a multimedia system, and that really hasn't happened. So my concern, and this is to the 5G one, you know, is that there's a lot of emphasis now primarily as kind of, if I were to kind of distill uh, the talks that I've heard on 5G and the, my kind of the punditry that I've read on 5G, if there was one, the buzzword that if you were to do word cloud uh, uh, with articles, probably Internet of Things would be the kind of a buzzword that dominates that word cloud. Because it's seen as a single new application. Yes, you can do faster video, but mine is, the screen isn't going to get that much bigger anytime soon, and so maybe that's not as good a selling point uh, as you might otherwise have, and 
performance is often limited by spectrum. So, but IoT is a single, well, that, gets, that even gets your congressperson excited. They may not exactly understand what it is, but it has internet on it and something that has uh, promises, untold uh, riches for new jobs, whatever. And so, but what we don't know is what people really want to use it for. And so we have to be careful that we don't design a system for something which may end up evolving into something completely different. So what we also in these type of systems, I think, have underestimated is not just the technical capability, but the financial viability of a particular service. So, for example, SMS really took off when SMS became relatively cheap, or in the U.S. when it essentially became free, namely that it was just bundled into your service as opposed to something else. Video only really took off on mobile systems, not based on capability, but that you had data buckets that were at least semi-affordable for actually streaming video. So it was really as much about economic feasibility from an end user perspective. And when you hear these prognoses about 5G, almost nobody seems to talk about can we make it cheaper so that these new 4K video applications are actually financially viable for a user as opposed to a demo that you do at some trade show. The other piece is that you had, uh, we have now learned, I think, a sequence of lessons that I have, and you could talk, of, I could talk much longer about that, many have much, you have more first-hand experience. So if you look at, kind of, if I were to look back on Volte and IMS and related type of multimedia subsystem, uh, multimedia attempts to provide that, is that IMS, among many other reasons, slow development, interoperability issues, intercarrier issues, uh, mm -hmm. notions when, when voice changes in communication pattern, et cetera, is that if people were to go back, I suspect one thing they would want to do is dramatically reduce the initial complexity of IMS, and just the spec length that you would have to do to do that, uh, to build even a basic voice service, certainly provided uh, or caused many of the issues of complexity and uh, interoperability and all that. The other one was it was always designed as a carrier service. So kind of the lesson there, don't be greedy. Uh, it was difficult to impossible for an over-the-top provider to provide an IMS service. This wasn't part of a plan, which meant nobody else who was a little faster than a carrier could actually seed the market and say, let me provide a maybe a niche-based, maybe vertical-based IMS-like service because they couldn't do that without being the carrier, essentially. I mean, I'm sure there's some theoretical possibility that you could do it, but you needed permission, certainly, of a carrier to do that. And they didn't really plan for inter-carrier interfaces. So the problem you always had was you couldn't really do a good multi-party call that sounded better than the old voice call because unless you called somebody within the same carrier and you were lucky that that entity, that person also had uh, the same uh, advanced handset, it sounded just like an old phone call. The other piece, I think, other lesson I think we learned in a different technology, namely Wi-Fi as an enterprise and home technology, when it became a public technology, we learned that the notion that you should just simply trust the advertisement of the SSID that you got as a text string that anybody could assert was a really bad idea. The notion of trusting the network, I think, in Wi-Fi, and it's actually been true in the cellular world as well, turned out to be probably one of the largest security oversights, besides kind of some of the initial thing of trying to invent your own security scheme, uh, WEP and all that. If you're not a security expert, is probably professionally uh, inadvisable. But the other one is that, and this is what we suffer with until today, is the notion that I can only identify an access point to see if it's one I want to connect to as opposed to one that's going to steal my, uh, redirect my domain name service and do other nasty stuff is really hasn't been built in. It's possible now, we can do that, but I don't think anybody really on a large scale implements uh, that model, the WPA2 type of thing. <clears throat> 
The other experience that we had is that we need to have the ability to disaggregate functions. The model up to now, and I'm fearful that it is continuing, is that the motion is you always have a, a single carrier logical entity, at least, providing those functions. What we've learned, and I think this has been a theme in many of the presentation I heard uh, early in the week, is what, what application developers like is the ability to have small single function devices, uh, single function interfaces that they can easily build something new without having to worry about a thousand pages worth of other APIs. We saw that in SIP APIs a few years ago, Jane, all of that, my multi-volume type of specifications where you had to my, take two semesters worth of courses before you could write your first line of code. That just doesn't cut it anymore uh, for a variety of reasons. So we need to have a clean model uh, that you have, and you shouldn't assume that these elements are trustworthy necessarily. Most of them will be, but you just have to not assume that as a built-in function, and IMS in many ways, for example, did that. So if you look at the app stores, I was the, one of the things that I think the success of the App Store was that it was neutral to the application largely. I mean, Apple does its reviews and all that, but generally speaking, they didn't try to anticipate which applications would be in them. And if we look at uh, the, uh, the experience that we've had now from fiber to the home and other type of fiber models, that we learned that backhaul costs, as opposed to the more, more, more attractive um, spectrum issue and spectrum cost issues, are really what drives the deployment costs of networks, particularly with densifications. We had a Verizon talk early on that. It's largely about backhaul. And so re-leveraging existing backhaul facility is as important, if not more important, in many cases now than spectrum. So long term, <laughs> One of the lessons that I think we have, and this is an attempt to kind of uh, cut out some, uh, I mean, just your, your basic uh, architecture diagrams. If you look at all the different interfaces, which each means it has a protocol, it each needs to be secured, it each needs to be configured, where do I find those, particularly once I virtualize networking functions. Each one of these interfaces means more complexity, more interfaces, more possibilities for interoperability failures. So if you want to make it difficult for application developers to use your functions in a disaggregated way, that's a good way to design it. The other piece that I think we've learned in the last few years is that there's a fundamental tension between the notion that you have one overarching network. I think it was always the notion that just like in the old days, the only network that existed was the phone network. And when you were a bell company that operated that, and if you wanted communication, you went to your local phone company of some sort, whether it's modem or voice or whatever. But what we've seen now is, at least for the time being, that in the local area network, that we're seeing the emergence of niche networks that have overlapping functionality but survive because they provide unique functionality. Maybe Wi-Fi will take them over because, in principle, Anything you can do with NFC or Zigbee or Bluetooth, you can probably do with Wi-Fi. I don't see any signs of that happening. And I just put up, and this is, there's probably other reasons, that NFC actually, its advantage is it has short range, meaning uh, for payment applications, that's what you want, so you don't have to worry about who is actually paying for that cup of coffee right now, who's all standing in line, because it only has a few inches worth of range. Zigbee has low cost and low energy and a mesh network built in, so that's something you can get. Bluetooth is ubiquitous uh, and cheap to deploy uh, in that because it's built in for other functions like headsets and so on. And Wi-Fi obviously gives you the speed range and the gigabit range and so on. So we've now evolved related. They obviously share unlicensed spectrum. They share many of the technical details, but we have different network applications. And they have survived and are likely to survive. It's not likely that any of those will go away uh, in addition to other networks that you can think of. So the other piece, and this is, goes back to the notion that uh, 5G will be driven by IoT applications, 
is that what we've seen recently emerging are these specialized applications, uh, specialized networks, long range networks, low bandwidth networks that are optimized for IoT. I won't go into great detail here, I'm going to go for all the table points, uh, but let me just maybe switch to the next slide because it's a little easier to read. Uh, so, everybody heard here, anybody here has heard of Sigfox? Nope, okay. Sigfox is a low range, low speed network, so we're talking about a data rate of 0 0.0 kilobits per second, no gigabits here, but it is cheap to deploy. You can basically, this relatively small company in Europe has created nationwide coverage, I think in Spain and in Portugal, so mid-sized countries with a fairly different topology in that, with pretty broad coverage, because each cell tower in rural area gets you 30 to 50 kilometers worth of coverage, so you don't need that many cell towers. Densification isn't on that map. But for many applications, and it's unlicensed spectrum, the ISM band unlicensed spectrum, so they don't have spectrum cost um, themselves. And, but for many wide area applications, think traffic lights, electric meters, all the stuff that is likely not in a building necessarily, or maybe difficult to reach uh, by uh, local area networks, often has very low bandwidth doesn't apply to security cameras and a few other things, but generally speaking, many of these devices have, they only send a few bits a day. And so a low bit rate doesn't really matter. What matters is ubiquity. You just want to pop up a electric meter at a pumping station somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. And you want to be able to read that meter remotely without having to worry about does it have cell phone coverage, how much do I have to pay each month for that little SIM chip, uh, do I have to change the SIM chip when, uh, when the carrier changes its technology, all of these separate things. So you can now get ubiquitous deployment at very low cost. So the question then is can in that particular niche large-scale, low-bandwidth communication, I compete with that. And there's other technologies that are somewhat similar, make different trade-offs, like LoRa and Ingenu, uh, that all have this type of notion of forget bandwidth, optimize for coverage, optimize for low cost. So the other, and we had an earlier discussion of weeks, this is partially reflecting that uh, breakfast discussion, is that we're two applications. So I mentioned IoT briefly, and I'll get back to that momentarily. The other application, which I think is starting to emerge in many countries, even in 4G realm, that uh, you forget mobility and you essentially use wireless uh, last mile access uh, as a competitor primarily to DSL. It's hard to do with cable and fiber because the bandwidths you get are probably much larger, but in many rural and suburban areas, uh, you still DSL dominates, particularly in Europe where you don't have large scale uh, cable infrastructure. And so if you can provide reliably more than 10 megabits of bandwidth, you're a pretty good competitor to at least with the more rural DSL, in a sense longer, uh, longer distance DSL. Uh, and so that's all quite possible, and they're commercial products. I know Verizon offers in the U.S. and Deutsche Telekom, uh, at least used to, I'm not sure if they still do, offers it in, in Germany for, uh, as a DSL competitor. You could choose DSL or uh, uh, 4G, and you actually got somewhat better peak speed, certainly, on uh, 4G than you do on most DSL. Uh, the problem, again, is the economics. So I did some, you take two points and extrapolate to infinity, which is really good data science, not recommended for any students here, but maybe does for a slide. So I looked up the data that I have for Comcast uh, data usage. Uh, it's actually fairly hard to find out what the real data usage is for wireline networks. Um, and yeah, it's Cisco data and so on, but it's, that's pretty broad. Uh, is, so in August 2013, the median, so half used more, half used less, not the mean, which is obviously going to be much larger. Uh, Comcast cable customer, Xfinity cable customer used 16 gigabytes. In mid-2015, which is what I looked up yesterday, it's 40 gigabytes, so it's roughly 50% year-over-year growth. So fearlessly extrapolating that to 2020, which is often seen as the 5G uh, market uh, one, we get to 300 gigabytes. <laughs> 
which actually doesn't seem that unreasonable. It actually happens to be uh, the number you would get to, uh, and I, I may mention that later, is that when you substitute voice uh, video that you do on cable today, linear video uh, type of cable TV, and move that on modest HD to uh, IP. So it's not completely unreasonable, obviously. I, this is a fearless extrapolation with not much uh, to go by, uh, but let's just assume that for a moment. The problem is that the business model or the cost model for consumer just doesn't work. At the typical rate of 10 gigabytes per gig, uh, ten dollars per gigabyte today, you would have to pay today to get the equivalent median usage. So if you get 50 percent at, at 50 percent point, it's 400 dollars per month. I mean, obviously, completely non-competitive. Or in 3,000 dollars if you want to be ridiculous in 2020. Now you could argue that the cost per gigabyte for, for G will just drop precipitously. But that, unless you have a dramatic increase in data usage on the cellular mobile side, that may not happen. And indeed, I wasn't able to quickly find the graph, but people have been citing the $10 a gigabyte figure now for several years. It really hasn't moved much. It's going down a little bit maybe at the top end. Uh, and I'll show a figure on that in, in a second. But uh, it's not dr dropped dramatically, certainly not 50% a year which is what you need to do to keep up with that, to just stay even with bandwidth increases on the landline side. Prices for mobile data would have to drop 50% a year. They haven't uh, in the past five years, even though we've had widespread rollout of 4G, and they don't seem likely anytime soon unless there's a real strong disruption of somewhere which I don't see coming. Right, so this is really not a can I supply bandwidth in rural and semi-rural areas via 4G or 5G, is can I do it at, that's cost competitive to a wireline infrastructure? And so far at least nobody has made a case that you can do that uh, without ruining your, uh, yeah, uh, your regular business model. For IoT, the other point beyond just the emergence of dedicated networks is that many of the applications are not mobile. Indeed, most of the IoT applications that people talk about, except for in-vehicle applications, which often use the 5G, spe the 5 gigahertz spectrum, 5.8 uh, gigahertz spectrum, are not mobile because they're usually attached to some equipment, a building, on a, a light pole, a traffic light, whatever it happens to be, and they don't typically move. And, but almost all of those are very cost sensitive because it's an additional expense beyond what you pay for the actual equipment. So it's often paid back in incremental reductions in maintenance costs and so on. So you have very little budget to play with to make that economically efficient. So if we look basically on to uh, the notion of video for a moment, uh, again, if you look at moving IP video, to, uh, uh, sorry, linear video to uh, a IP environment, you have a Netflix data, and you typically have the best quality, uses up to one gigabyte an hour, which means at current rates, you would have to pay what you pay Netflix per month for one hour of watching the video on your device. So completely infeasible, even for getting screen sizes and all of that. So this is just not a plausible economic one. Forget the technology. And indeed, just to, this is the most recent Verizon data, simply because I had a nice uh, graphic. Uh, as you can see, at median points, it's still about $10 a gigabyte, a little more if you have less, and a little, uh, a little less if you use the, the largest plan. And I saw a nice, uh, for IoT, going back to that, a nice little uh, summary of some of the possible IoT applications uh, that you have. And without going through each one of those in great detail, is you see that m for many of these, except for vehicular, is they're not mobile, like I said. Uh, and they typically have low rate. You see that on almost all of them. 
uh, except for connected vehicles. Again, and for connected vehicles, in many cases, ubiquity matters more than speed, uh, just simply because you don't want to lose connectivity in that. And for many of the vehicular application, it's probably more vehicle to vehicle applications that matter for safety uh, purposes and so on. Or you have short range applications like tolling and uh, electron equivalent of electronic signs and all of that, which tend to be fairly short range uh, one or very low bandwidth as well. So you could use cellular for that. It's not obvious that they have extremely low latency requirements. You're not going to steer a car, an autonomous vehicle, remotely via 4, 5G. I just don't see that as I mean, a viable mechanism uh, in, in for a variety of just practical reasons uh, in that. I mean, go into a tunnel and suddenly your car goes, sorry, no GPS coverage, and crash into the bottom. So, okay. And this is just for pricing data in that. One other top for broadband uh, data, which is based on the new America uh, data uh, that they collect. One other piece that I wanted to make, and I'm not going to give an RF talk here, and you won't be able to read it, but you'll get the slides later, is people also talk about if there is one kind of theme for 5G uh, and the technology side is moving to higher frequencies simply because the lower frequencies are pretty much booked up. Uh, and so one of the caveats that I would like to add to that, that's great, but you're not going to get coverage. And it's kind of a, you see this dichotomy, everybody, sell, everybody but Sprint at the moment, because they seem to be out of money, but uh, is salivating for 600 uh, megahertz spectrum. Not six gigahertz or 60 gigahertz, 600 megahertz spectrum, because all of them want all the three major carriers or maybe some of the rural ones, they want uh, coverage in areas where they don't have coverage right now, even at relatively low speeds, because we're talking 10 megahertz blocks type of thing. Uh, so you now have a problem that I don't see that these six gigahertz and above or three gigahertz and above range, which are not currently used for licensed cellular type of services, uh, are largely going to be indoor coverage and some limited outdoor coverage. Short range simply because of propagation characteristics and all of that. So what we see is that we have three very different uh, issues in terms of radios. Namely, we have a rural low density problem. Uh, we need to have a I mean, four or five mile range of that. I just don't see that happening with multi gigahertz type of bands. I mean, not at reasonable power and all of that. And then we have the urban outdoors problem and then the urban indoor problem or rural indoor for that matter. Again, if you look at 20 gigahertz, you have quite a bit of attenuation, which will make it very difficult for, by building materials like glass uh, to make it, or sheetrock or any of these things, it makes it very difficult to have a classical cell tower model where an outside cell site, whether attached to a building or to a tower, illuminates the indoor of uh, buildings. And many of the uses that people anticipate that are new, particularly high uh, I mean, high volume usages are likely going to be indoors in some capacity. And indoors could be inside a vehicle, same type of problem. Uh, namely, when, you, when your backseat back kids want to watch a video and they don't want to use a DVD because they, they don't know what the silver disc is anyway, but they, uh, they need, again, 5G at 20 gigahertz isn't going to illuminate your car. And just Again, this is more for reference purposes. There are a number of interesting high bandwidth, high frequency bands out there, but in many cases they're even they're already used primarily for satellite type of uses, simply because you don't have uh, the propagation issues since you have a clear line of sight to the satellite, just the atmosphere, as opposed to worrying about buildings and reflections and, and all of that. The other piece is that we are finding ourselves in a changing spectrum environment. There just isn't any easily convertible spectrum available anymore. As they like to say in Washington, the spectrum pipeline is dry. It usually takes anywhere from five to 10 years between the time you identify a spectrum block, even if it's just a few megahertz, Identify who is using that spectrum if it's an incumbent, there's some incumbent, there's invariably is, there just isn't any more white 
spaces of that sort available and then move the uh, incumbent, auction the spectrum, license it in some way, and then move the incumbents out of that spectrum or make them coexist in some way. That's usually a 10-year type of time frame, plus or minus. Even for like the 600 megahertz incentive auction that's going to be taking place next year, uh, in that it's going to take years before the TV stations get reorganized and before my, the carriers that win the spectrum actually get to deploy it. This is not something you just do uh, like you might do a new unlicensed block in the old days where it's essentially product development life cycle, maybe of a year or two. So except at these highest of frequencies where there are still some slivers of unused uh, one, particularly if coexistence with satellites is possible, uh, all new spectrum will be shared spectrum where you have incumbents that will occupy that spectrum by time and space, and then you'll have to work around that. So we need to have frequency agile systems that basically don't assume that a spectrum will be available on a long-term basis or in a wide area. It may just disappear completely for a while in a certain area, and a certain area could be a whole state, for example. So if we look at one a recent example, where it is probably the first large-scale attempt to do that, uh, the FCC in April this year uh, made initial rules for the 150 megahertz, so quite a bit of spectrum, at 3.5 gigahertz. Uh, and up there. Unfortunately, that spectrum is currently used by the Department of Defense radars, uh, primarily shipboard radars. Uh, but shipboard can mean Great Lakes, which covers, and because of range, covers a fair amount of, say, Chicago, uh, and uh, fixed satellite service providers as downlinks. Uh, and if you do a traditional exclusion zones by just where could you generate interference, radar of a problem is uh, while they send at really high power, the reflected signal is really low power, so if you have an emitter like a cell site, uh, in that even very far away, it would appear as some spurious radar echo, uh, even if it's really far away, far beyond kind of the boundaries of the Great Lakes, uh, where you would care about shipboard radar, it would look like a radar echo. So if you do traditional exclusion zones, you have about 60% of the U.S. population that couldn't use that new spectrum. So what you end up with is essentially a mechanism which I suspect will be similar to what will happen in other bands uh, once they're identified. Again, this is difficult. Namely, you have incumbent users where the easy route, instead of fighting them, is basically say, yep, you get to stay there. You're usually not na national. We'll just basically grandfather you in, uh, and we'll just make the exclusion zones as small as I mean, we can make them so that we don't rule out the whole country, basically, in that. And we also now do temporal exclusion zones in the sense that instead of simply saying, yep, there could be a Navy exercise in the Great Lakes or uh, whatever at some point or along the, the eastern seaboard, uh, it, but it's only really done maybe a few times a year. So maybe instead of doing it year-round, you do it only when there's truly a need to do that. And you could do that down to I mean, minutes and hours if necessary as opposed to just whole time blocks. Then they have the uh, priority license that you basically have a licensing mechanism, which is kind of an auction type mechanism. Uh, but it's interestingly a three year non renewable license. Uh, usually other li spectrum licenses are either indefinite or we might kind of, you can assume you get them renewed if you use it, but you only kind of a use it or lose it type of proposition in that. And then there's a separate class for hospitals and so on. So if we look at networks for kind of a first, the 1G, 4G, the basic architecture actually hasn't changed. You had a carrier that did essentially the whole ecosystem. They owned the tower kind of at that. They owned the fiber, the backhaul, if they were particularly if they had a traditional Bell successor like AT&T and Verizon had a lot of their own backhaul. Uh, they owned stores, physical stores, even as franchises. They sold you the handset. They had to give you SIM cards. And in some cases, they even provided applications in that. And obviously provided pr protocol infrastructure, IMS voice, and all of that. But that's not really the only model to organize networks. It's actually a fairly unusual model if you look at other networks uh, in that. So if we look kind of to 2020 and beyond, 
imagine we'll actually see some changes in that. I'll get to that. And in the LTE model, you essentially had, I mentioned that for IMS, the assumption implicit, I don't think it's ever spelled out, was that the model, once you use subscribe to one carrier as a customer, you never had two at the same time or more than that. You might have two phones, but that's really the only model. And even if the two SIMs in a phone, you would switch between those, but at any given time, one carrier at a time, and then you might have roaming into different networks where there was a carrier-to-carrier -carrier agreement, both financial and technical, to do that. But if we look at headnets and more 5G type of thing, is that the only model to build a carrier? We can now imagine a disaggregated carrier where you have lots of entities with relatively simple open interfaces that provide functions of that. We're already seeing that happening in the cell tower realm. From my understanding is, at least at the traditional macro cell towers, most of the cell towers are now owned by companies like Crown Castle and American Tower and so on. They're shared assets between multiple providers. They're not just Verizon cell tower and AT&T cell tower. It's a cell tower that has tenants on it simply because you can't really put four cell towers into a community without getting a lot of community pushback, among other reasons, cost and backup power and so on. And then you have Backhaul providers like Fiberlight and Zeo and all that that provide uh, uh, backhaul. Then you have backbone providers with traditional level threes. You have spectrum database operators. You have app vendors, obviously, which are usually completely one. Apple now essentially becoming a bank where you can kind of lease your cell phone. Uh, and obviously with provider. You have competing or cooperating uh, wireline providers like the cell companies offering Wi-Fi services. And you now have a model that equipment vendors, particularly Ericsson seems to be doing that a business model, is not just selling boxes and software, but they're actually operating the network for somebody else. So you now have a very different network model. In a sense, you can imagine a much more disaggregated or reshuffled network where the equipment vendor does most of it in one model, completely integrated, or you have a piecemeal model as opposed to just a the classical version. You either had a physical infrastructure-based network or you had an MVNO, uh, a virtual network operator, which didn't really own anything except a customer and billing relationship. So in many ways, you have a, a kind of a carrier, and this is already true in many countries that are, uh, let's say, have uh, later to the cellular system, uh, many African and Asian countries in particular, have a model where you have essentially the carrier is almost more like a brand. The other ones you see in a billboard, behind the scenes is actually somebody else managing that network that actually does all of that. So it's really just a marketing organization in that. And a slightly less a uh, radical version, you can think of a carrier more like an airline that just buys planes and management and food services from vendors and integrates that to the outside world so you fly on United or, or Southwest Airline, but it's really, well, it's a leased airline made by Boeing or Airbus. Uh, they get the food from somewhere else. They get the airport, obviously, is uh, by somebody else, etc. And this is just the cell tower model uh, in that. Again, if you look at the number of cell towers, uh, SBA communication, I think, is at and if I'm not mis mistaken, uh, but I could be wrong on that. So far the largest one are now Crown Cross Castle and American Tower. Uh, they've got a bunch of Verizon wireless uh, towers in that, each about 40,000 towers in, the, uh, in uh, the U.S. in that. And that's partially because towers are pretty expensive. Uh, so uh, the cost per tower is about $150,000, and the, the total number of towers in the U.S. is about uh, 200,000 towers in that. So 80,000 of those certainly are accounted for by the two largest asset providers in that. So also when we think of architecture for 5G, we should also look at what traditional carriers are good at. We had version of that discussion at breakfast, so I won't belabor it too much, but think about do we think of carriers now doing research? In the old days, yes, they did. They each had labs. Which carrier, even the largest carrier, has traditional research lab, advanced development labs, or anything like that? 
do we think of carriers as having Google or Amazon-like software development capabilities? I'm sure they have good software developers, but it's not, I have to admit, for students who are graduating from Columbia University, if they're looking at software companies, uh, the carriers are typically not all that high on the list for whatever reason. Do they build I oh, mean, really popular over the top application. I can't remember one that was built by one of the carriers recently. Huh? Have they distinguished themselves as a provider of API-based services? So forget on. And some carriers have tried. There's the GSM-1 uh, type of effort that I, I don't know what happened to it, but I mean, it's, it started at some point. But if you look at the kind of services for higher level ones, they were built on the voice side just in our realm of interest, by companies like Topo and Twilio and a bunch of others like that that are not distinctly not carriers. They don't want to be carriers. They're certainly not wireless carriers. And they build these type of services that app, uh, application developers interface with, and then they use lower level SMS and voice and so on services. So longer term, what I'd, I'd like to think about is if we assume that we don't know what the organizational structure is and that, that, that might actually vary between companies and uh, just like you have kind of full service airlines and ones which are essentially just branded least ones, they don't own anything uh, type of airlines, uh, that you have a model that allows for that organizational diversity, not just application diversity. So what would be the simplest kind of network that provides basic access and mobility type of functions? It's really just an IPv6 access, whatever it happens to be, or however many spectrum bands that you have, with an IP address allocation, a AAA server somewhere that does the authentication, and some home location reg uh, register, that's not even clear you need that. Uh, you have a SIP server somewhere uh, that you, if you want to provide traditional voice services, and you have network resources of various sort uh, that, you, that you allocate. That's really all, and if you boil down what you really need, that's largely what it is. Also, where do we lead really true mobility? Much of the complexity of IMS and much of the complexity of 4G type of networks is because of uh, mobility. Primarily because you now have the ability to access uh, service providers, headnets, all of that. And all of these mobile IP and other mobility systems tend to be fairly complex because they have security problems if you're not careful. Somebody can spoof you and all of that. For HTTP video, you really don't need it. For notifications, you don't need it. Maybe not even for other real-time media. So I mentioned earlier the example for IoT networks. One reason that they're so much simpler is because they're essentially stateless networks. Even if they move, because they don't need a long-lived connections, they can dispense with all the mobility stuff. They just send a message from somewhere else. Same crypto token, but different access point and the network doesn't care. They just route them completely statelessly. You do have modification problems, all of that, but that's uh, manageable. Should also think about making networks much more location aware. I mean, for 3G, 2G type of networks and 4G, you basically you know largely the cell sector in that. But we need to be location aware, and we maybe a whole 911 discussion during a track, during a uh, conference here, illustrated out that being one of the central problems is that we have this really kludgy way of getting location, which takes one is various obscure paths through things that have. Somebody had a really nice slide about this firewall where you have a network on one side, the device that knows a lot about the network lo your location, and the network that knows almost nothing or at least exposes almost nothing to the rest of the world in that. So you have to always work around those limitations in some relatively crude way. And because all of the devices will have multiple radios as well. The other piece which we don't pay as much attention to is that the current model of enrolling devices into the network is completely broken. The notion that you have to go to a store and get a little piece of plastic with a chip embedded in it, open up your device, insert it, and then call up a provider and read off some string of digits to the provider if it's not a device that's made by the, uh, by the or sold directly by the provider itself, by the carrier, 
just doesn't work. The notion that you need stores to do most of that also doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, what's the value add of that besides sell you I mean, cell phone cases or something like that? So how do we do that in a way that enrollment becomes much simpler, much easier, so that I can simply unpack a device, type in the carrier, just like I do when I register here to the network. I don't have to put in, I don't have to go to an office and get a SIM card just to use the Wi-Fi here. I mean, people would consider it completely ridiculous if somebody even suggested that. So the other one is that they have to, uh, any, my hypothesis is one of the things that any new network technology, besides promising more bandwidth and whatever else, other features or latency, any new network technology will be justified at least in part by providing quality of service. It didn't quite work out for 1G, maybe not for 2G, certainly not for 3G, not for 4G, but we'll definitely get there for 5G. I don't think that's going to work all that much better for a variety of reasons. Namely, to succeed as a network, your average quality has to be good enough to be workable. If only your premium quality is good enough, you end up like United Airlines. Right? Might, might be, they might be provide good business class service, kind of, which used to be as good as you got in, in, in economy class a few years ago, but that doesn't make you a popular airline. So the business model for quality of service has always been a difficult one. I, I won't belabor it here, I, which happens if you look at it as an example in the Washington DC area, there was a lot of hype about having toll roads that you would pay for, uh, for bypass congestion. Almost all of them have significantly underperformed expectations. Uh, the pri private operators have difficulty making their investment back because far fewer people will actually pay extra to save some unknown number of minutes uh, during congestion. And the problem is QoS, QoS is not usually accessible to the application. The network APIs that we have today are really, really simple and basic. I, you can detect whether you have on Wi-Fi on cellular, that's pretty much it. We need to do much better than that. Mobile, even though we talk about video dominating the network, in many cases, it's notifications that drive the network and battery usage. So having a better model for push notifications, currently the model is very kludgy from a developer perspective. Uh, it's, it requires all kinds of contortions to make that work. Uh, is, I think, would be a real opportunity to make new applications work and because many of the things like wearables are not going to be streaming video, but they're essentially going to be notification devices both ways, uh, notifications in and uh, notifications out. The other piece is pricing-wise, there's a lot of interest in kind of surge pricing. If you want to talk to how to make your company uh, unpopular, uh, just talk to Uber about that. Um, differentiated pricing for quality of service or surge or congestion or whatever you want to do might be economically efficient and optimal in some way. Humans don't seem to like it quite as much. Right? The other point is that our new competitors, interesting enough, usually compete on simplicity. When uh, T-Mobile came about, they want to, they didn't say we have better technology, they didn't. We don't have better quality of service, they probably didn't. What they said is, we don't have all this complexity in terms of a business model and the gotchas in there like service contract, data overages, uh, limits, et cetera, okay, rate increases, all of that. One other point is we tend to focus on the investment angle uh, in terms of how many dollars does it take to buy a spectrum, build radios, all of that. The vast majority of the expenses, and this is true across uh, three different, these are, happens to be wireline network, but the same numbers are pretty much applied to wireless as well, is most carriers spend about 12 to 15 percent on cap of their revenue on capital mm -hmm. investment, meaning 85 plus percent goes to something else. Meaning if we want to optimize cost, and I would argue like I said earlier, that most of what we need to do is optimize cost for reduce the cost per bit, the 85 percent would be a very good place to start to do that. One 5G prototype actually exists already. It's a headnet. It's called EduRoam. Very simple, has a AAA server, Radius AAA server, which works here as well, what I can tell. 
It's essentially a, a, a aggregation of university networks, that's the edge of your part, where students from any university can sign up to any other member or university of that. Extremely simple heterogeneous network system. Uh, it requires only a very simple database server in each institution, and it provides a very simple roaming technology that doesn't require SIMs, that doesn't require roaming agreements. Now, it helps that there's no money involved, but all of that can be done fairly simply. That's an, well, it's an example of how you can build that type of functionality in a much kind of more distributed way across hundreds or thousands of institutions. And let me conclude. If I take kind of a growing up lessons for generations is, I hope to have made at least briefly the point that complexity kills, you should play fair, meaning don't try to extract too much revenue from your consumer. CapEx, you pay once, generally speaking, for many years. OpEx is forever. Start optimizing the operational expenditure. Well, how can we do that? Make simpler networks is one part of that. Know where you are. Location matters, not just for 911, but for many other location optimizing network access and everything. Share everything you have individually. If you have a network component, make it accessible to other applications. Somebody might turn it into value that you couldn't unlock, but as an individual component, it might actually have more value than you can get out of it. But that means you have to be willing to share those things and don't trust strangers as in don't trust the network because it might just not be who they claim to be. Thank you very much, and I'll gladly take questions. So do some, um, obviously, between you and lunch. Uh, so I'll take some quick questions. Yes, I'll be quick. Um, you talked about spectrum, and it's something that's very dear to my heart. And in particular, it's how we make use of the existing mobile spectrum. And I would bet you that if you did uh, a scan now of all the usable uh, cellular spectrum that my iPhone can pick up, yep. I reckon that here in Chicago, what, 40 to 45% of it would be unused. So what do you say about changing the way? I know you're not at the FCC anymore, but What's your view on uh, using more efficient ways of licensing spectrum, and in particular, not awarding licenses to people to not use spectrum? Right. And that's been a traditional, and I, I will say I, 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 I do still work for the FCC, so I, that's been a traditional conundrum, namely how do you make people use the resource more effectively besides just the economic incentive in a sense. If you bought something for $40 billion total like AWS3, you have some incentive to actually make use of it. Um, and so the traditional model has been build out requirements, as you know, uh, which tend to be pretty loose and unevenly enforced uh, and probably difficult to enforce in particular. Uh, and I think, and this is more an economic problem, is a bit of, when I talk to my economist friends, is there's a bit of a, we know that the classical model of tight supervision just not, doesn't scale. I mean, you can't just send people around and measure spectrum utilization. The model of leasing spectrum on a very short-term basis, given the investment lifetimes you need for towers and radio equipment and all of that, is difficult to make work just practically speaking, because if you know you have to rebid for spectrum every 10 years, uh, what are you gonna do in year eight and nine in terms of investment because you don't know what you buy is gonna be worth anything because whoever buys it from you, it's like the refrigerator that you have in your house when you sell it, you're not gonna get a lot of premium value for it because they know you're not gonna take it with you. Uh, and so I think there's a little bit of a, we don't really know how to do that optimization in that. And it's to some large extent, it's been an economic trade-off that some carriers have now discovered that densification is probably starting to be cheaper than spectrum, namely reusing the spectrum that you have. And I think we, to some extent, will have to see as to whether entities, and you know who they are, uh, who buy spectrum but don't deploy networks can be more, can be encouraged to do that on a shorter time frame given that 
The old model was you had to put lots of towers in different places that take cons construction, which takes approvals. So you couldn't do that in a year, even under the best of circumstances. But now build out in intervals of 10 years, well, not that long usually, but uh, probably more than really is necessary. If you bought a spectrum for billions of dollars, why would you leave that asset, unless you're speculating on the spectrum, why would you leave that asset sitting idle for, I mean, you're paying interest on it for essentially eight years or 10 years uh, before getting any revenue out of it. So if you're doing that, maybe you're, you're a spectrum speculator, not a uh, spectrum user. Not a good answer, but you're raising a good question. So um, I, the, I was looking at your uh, Laura LAN and, and Sigfox slide and thinking that the spec looks remarkably like 2G. Why, why, why are people not seeing that as an opportunity to keep 2G but repurpose it? Is there some, something I've missed? I'm not sure I quite caught that. Uh, can you see? Uh, so why wouldn't PGPP integrate that? Is that what you're saying? Well, no, but just in terms of the spectrum characteristics, 2G yep. looks quite a lot like LoRaLAN and Sigfox. So isn't that an opportunity that people are missing? Or Yeah, so I mean, my sense is, and again, I have not built this on, is that a LoRa Sigfox modem is much, much simpler than a 3G modem. Uh, it doesn't have to do all the mobility management, all the frequency management, all of these type of things that you have to do. So the chip cost are much, much lower. The energy usage is much, much lower uh, than you have. They don't have to do, for example, the paging type things that you do for I mean, a mobile phone, which was assumed to be continuously powered. The Sigfox type device, it can essentially sleep, turn off a radio, not pay any attention to it, and then on occasion it wakes up it's scheduled for the downlink stuff so that it knows when to wake up. So as long as it can set an alarm clock to the respective time, it will get that message, if any. So it's a very different model, uh, both in ship cost and the energy cost uh, in that. I'm not saying you couldn't do it with 3G. There's obviously the, uh, the level zero, layer, level zero, I think they're called, devices that they're talking about now for 4G, uh, which are trying to do a little bit about single frequency as opposed to multiband, all of these things that you can do. but. Not quite there yet. I'll do one more question. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, IoT is considered to be one of the big uh, use cases for 5G. Uh, but at the same time, most of the IoTs may not require the bandwidth, high bandwidth requirements. Yep. And at the same time, some of these specialist networks are filling the gap and then coming up with uh, special purpose networks. So at the end, how, what's your opinion of how much Pi, uh, share uh, uh, 5G will get for IoT. Yeah, so in this, when I mean, you raise the point uh, in more detail than I made, I am having a hard time. Doesn't mean somebody won't come up with it. Uh, m IoT applications that are not indoors, where you would presumably use Wi Fi or something, I mean, think factory floor, <laughs> security cameras and campers, you're not going to put those on 5G. Well, why would you? I mean, unless the bandwidth costs are so competitive. It's much cheaper to just use your corporate network. So many of the 5G, many of the IoT type of applications are either in building or on premises of some sort, factory, commercial building, or campers, what have you. And there you have Wi-Fi and fiber and whatever. So I don't see those. Outside, kind of in outside your area, what I can tell outside the vehicular area, and those are largely for latency and reliability reasons, anything safety critical, you're not going to do across a network because you don't want to have a crash prevention that relies on the network working all the time in every single location. That's just not going to happen. Uh, you need to have something which is local only. I'm having a really hard time imagining for applications that are out in the middle of nowhere where my mobile and my cellular networks matter or add value that are really high bandwidth. And if you have an application, I'd love to hear about it, but none of the ones that people typically mention, agriculture, think of healthcare, usually the kind of things that you do for monitoring is either it's like the one bit information, namely somebody has just fallen down, 
or it is in-home monitoring. You're not going to carry your blood pressure monitor or and real monitoring equipment with you in random places, or I mean, it's not latency sensitive. I mean, the 4G will do, work just fine for it. 4G modem uh, attached to your cell phone, Bluetooth to your cell phone is probably for most of these just I mean, medical applications that need to be ubiquitous, probably just fine. So that's what I'm a little worried when carriers and equipment vendors just say, I, 5G motivated by IoT. Tell me exactly how and where and who's going to pay for that at that level that you're trying to make it pay. Uh, I'm sure I certainly don't have the answers to that, but so far at least the suggestions I've heard have been less than convincing. Okay, um, I think I'll leave it at that. And thank you so much. And. Uh,